Here we go. We have our agenda. Um, and also thank you to those who have utilized our Q&A feature. You're really paying attention here. We will share these slides and uh, the presentation as well. All right, that's our agenda for today. First, we'll have an overview of our Safe Clean Water program, and then we'll get into the mini grants and refill station grants. Um, then towards the end, we'll focus on the scope writing and budget best practices. And throughout all this, um, feel free to, again, raise your hand on Zoom or type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, just a quick announcement. Uh, we got a couple of questions in the Q&A box um, about the PowerPoint and video. Um, we will, we actually, there a lot of the PowerPoints are already posted on our website, but we will share that information after the, the workshop. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so for those unfamiliar with us, we are the Santa Clara Valley Water District, also known as Valley Water. We are a public agency that is a special district of the state of California. On the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see Valley Water's mission, which is to provide Silicon Valley with safe, clean water for a healthy life, environment, and economy. And then the three pictures there depicts the three pillars of our mission, which is clean, reliable water, flood protection, and healthy creeks and ecosystems. Each of our grant funding opportunities are based on these three pillars. All right. So uh, on this slide, you'll see an overview of each program um, that we provide. Um, so starting with standard grants, we'll just briefly go over this one um, since this workshop is focused on maintenance and refills. But for standard grants, uh, there is no minimum or maximum funding amount, and we have up to $1.4 million per fiscal year uh, to distribute amongst uh, this grant type. Uh, these are typically five-year agreements from your term date, and the funding is reimbursement-based. Uh, currently, it's going through a redesign, and some of the elements of this program will be updated to align with the feedback we received from grantees and our internal stakeholders. So our next standard grant cycle will open in the fall. More information and updates will be shared through our website at valleywater.org slash grants in our, main, in our mailing list. Up next, we have mini grants, which are up to $5,000 per project and are meant to serve as seed funding um, pilot a smaller scale project or program or be used as secondary funding for a larger project. Uh, applications are accepted on a rolling basis or until all funds are expended in the fiscal year, which is uh, up to $100,000 per fiscal year. And lastly, we have refill station grants, which have a cap of $5,000 per station and are expected to be completed within one year of their agreement term. The funding is 50% upfront and the remainder is, uh, allocate, or is uh, distributed upon completion. Uh, this opportunity is also on a rolling basis or until funds are distributed. Next slide, please. So regarding applicant eligibility, we accept applications from the following organization types and groups that work or provide services within Santa Clara County. So, um, if you have an opportunity, you can read through those organizations types listed on the screen. Um, just in general, it's typically public agencies, special districts, uh, nonprofit organizations with a 501c3 tax exempt status, uh, as well as uh, the other ones that are listed on your screen. Next slide. To be eligible for the mini grant program, projects must be located within Santa Clara County and provide one or more of the following benefits, which are listed on your screen. Uh, some of those include enhancing creek and bay ecosystems, improving fish passage and habitat, and identifying potential water reduction technologies and methods, as well as uh, many other options. So here are just two examples of some of our mini grant projects that we funded in the past. One of them is with Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, where they did a, a mural at Hellier County Park. And then the other is for Friends of Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County, where they did a teaching and demonstration garden uh, for the community. And we have more examples and information about the projects on our website. Okay, so for refill station grants, the project eligibility is pretty simple. 
um, like mini grants, the location of the proposed refill station grant uh, or refill station must be in Santa Clara County and it must have public access. And uh, another eligibility requirement um, is that uh, there's priority given for locations that serve economically disadvantaged communities or school age children and students. And here are some examples of different kinds of refill stations that were installed throughout Santa Clara County. Uh, grantees can choose any refill station style that best fits their need. We have a document on our resource page that shows different models of refill stations and the approximate costs for your reference. Okay, so now that we've gone over applicant and project eligibility, we will cover the application requirements. The applications are online on our dedicated grants portal called Flux. You can access Flux from our website or directly on valleywater.flux.io. And that's where you'll find the applications and other documents. If you're unfamiliar with Flux, we have a demo video that can show you how to navigate the system. So next are the other documents that are required with your application. First is the assigned IRS W9 tax form, and the next is site permissions from the property owner. And that can look like a lease agreement, a property owner consent letter, or permit. So before you start any activity, make sure you have the site permissions. Next slide. So there are more document requirements. Another important one is the delegation of authority documentation. And this document confirms that the person signing the grant application has the authority to do that on behalf of the organization. If you don't have a delegation of authority document, document, then we have a template resolution that you can use for reference on our resource page. Um, the next requirement is just a picture of the proposed location. And then the last two on the slide apply only to mini grants, and that is the 25% match of the total project cost and a timeline with a task list. And we'll go over these last two more in depth in the scope and budget section. Okay, now we'll just do a step-by-step -step guide with the application process. Again, we'll go over this more in depth later. Step one, you check our website to see if your organization and your proposed project meets the requirements. Step two, you go into the Flux portal and you can register yourself and your organization and you can view the application. Step three, you gather all the required documents and information needed. And step four, you fill out the application, submit it along with the documentation and grant staff can start the review. Speaking of review, during this review process, um, there are some insurance and environmental compliance requirements that the project needs to meet. So for insurance, um, the, the grantee is required to have insurance for the entire term of the agreement. And um, depending on the project, staff can work with you to get a waiver or adjustment. And that really depends on the approval of our risk manager. So we will help facilitate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, typically for refill station grants, we are able to get a waiver of insurance, but again, it depends. All right, for CEQA or CEQA, that as a public agency, we are required to comply with the California Environmental Quality Act. And that requires us to do, do, to do an environmental impact review for all projects, including grants. And again, we have our internal staff that does this review. That's our environmental planning unit. And grant staff will help uh, facilitate this review. They don't do the review. They just kind of liaise between our planners and the applicant. Next slide. All right. So this is a brief depiction of our mini grant program timeline. Um, we're gonna go over this briefly, but it can also be found and downloaded on our mini grants webpage. So for mini grants, it starts off with the applicants submitting their application. Applications are submitted, are accepted on a year round uh, rolling basis and can be submitted at valleywater.flux.io. Uh, after um, applications are submitted, 
uh, you guys will be notified uh, of your funding status between four to six weeks of submittal after we do our reviews. Um, and then we'll move then to execution of the agreement. And so if your agreement is awarded, grants program staff will work with you to finalize your agreement. Once executed, uh, then we'll move into the invoicing process where you'll be able to submit your initial 50% uh, uh, invoice reimbursement uh, for your project. And then after your project has been completed, then we'll move to project closeout in which you will receive the remaining 50% of the uh, grant award amount. Uh, we really strive to ensure a smooth process um, throughout our mini grant program. So our goal is to support you throughout the journey of your mini grant project. So please let us know if you have any questions. This slide shows a timeline for our refill station grants. Uh, first step, of course, is the application step where we receive your application through Flex. The second step is the award step that normally takes two to four weeks. And this is when uh, grant staff reviews your application. And that includes the insurance and CEQA that I mentioned earlier. Third is the execution step, which could take four to six weeks. And this is where we finalize the agreement, get the signatures. And after that, we can give you half of the funds and you can start your project. And the fourth step is the installation and closeout. You've installed your refill station and you've given us the two closeout documents, which is just a photo of the finished area and a final payment request. Okay, so what are the next steps? Well, you can start by visiting our grants portal on our website, and you can register your organization in the Flux Grants Management System. And you can also explore our mini grant and refill station pages for more information, frequently asked questions, and other resources to help guide you through the process. And last, you could stay on for this workshop and, and learn more about the scope and budget portion. All right, so um, that pretty much covers the first half of the workshop, or, which is basically the overview of our programs. And now we kind of want to continue that and talk more about how you can craft your scope and budget. And this specifically applies for your mini grant application. So uh, before I get right into it, just want to remind again, Flex will be our main portal for um, all the applications and all the documents in which you submit um the the, requir the required stuff for your application um, additionally the terms and framework that we will be using today and sharing with you all is what is typically aligned with what we use in the agreement um, and just going back with the whole redesign process is um, once you know the redesign is complete all these components will be factored into the application and we're looking to uh, streamline it um, so that it's more aligned with the agreement as well All right, so first we'd like to provide you with an overview of the scope and budget. Um, the scope outlines three important things about your project. It identifies your project's objectives and deliverables. It defines your key tasks and milestones, and it also highlights your project's purpose and impact. Um, the budget is a summary of the major expense categories and funding sources that ensure success to completing your project. It includes both cash expenses and in-kind contributions, which we will be talking more about later on in this presentation. And your budget directly aligns with what is listed in your agreement. Um, we also do have a template for the budget that's linked on our online resource webpage for you to use um, if you need it. And I'll pass it over to Diana to bring us um, to talk more about the scope. Great, thanks. Okay, in reviewing many applications and putting the scope into agreements, we realized that it would be helpful to set up a scope framework that most mini grants can use. Um, there's flexibility, however, we recommend following this framework for a smoother, more effective application and eventual agreement. We hope this framework will help organizations think of all the inputs and outputs in the project. Um, next slide. So first, the framework includes the background, and the background basically highlights the purpose of the project. And next is project objectives, and these are clear and measurable goals that the project aims to achieve. 
Next are the tasks. Now this is where the activities that will be done to meet the project objectives are. And they describe the activity, the deliverable and the timeline. And next is the expected outcome. So this is what you anticipate the results to be or the impacts of the projects to be um, overall. So tasks, just a little more on tasks. So they, um, they, uh, sorry, yes. <laughs> We're going to go deeper dive down the tasks. This is for the category. So um, the tasks represent the activities, deliverables, and timeline that are needed to ensure project success. And as a tip, um, make sure your deliverables are really realistic, achievable, and measurable. So as mentioned earlier, the tasks in your scope can be organized into this framework. Um, in the next few slides, we'll be talking more about what each task is and they include. Um, we organize them in this framework of planning and design, outreach, implementation, and evaluation. We call them buckets or categories. So first off, we're planning and design. Um, this is usually the initial phase of the project. And this can include activities like researching, developing project plans, and creating designs or prototypes. A few examples of tasks that fall under planning are like um, except, uh, obtaining site permissions, developing plans and purchasing design materials, uh, training staff or volunteers. If your project, let's say, is a community garden, this could include tasks like drafting the garden layouts and obtaining necessary permits. Our next uh, category is outreach, our bucket. So this is where um, tasks are related to engaging the stakeholders of your project. Examples of the tasks can include developing an outreach plan for your project, um, materials, flyers, brochures, handouts, journals, advertising or social media booths, staff and volunteer hours for outreach and hosting community meetings. Like let's just say your project is a workshop promoting um, environmental conservation. So some outreach tasks might include uh, distributing informational flyers, engaging local media and posting on social media. Our next bucket, implementation. Um, this is where the actual execution of your project activities take place. So this is the workshop you planned, um, organizing and conducting a cleanup, installing a mural, conducting pre and post surveys, construction, planting vegetation or trees. Now let's go back to that community garden example. Uh, implementation tasks can include preparing the soil, building the raised beds and installing the irrigation system. Lastly, we have the evaluation uh, bucket. So these are tasks that are focused on assessing the effectiveness and impact of the project once it's complete. This can involve things like collecting and analyzing data gathered from surveys, preparing and writing any written reports or presentations, collecting testimonials or conducting interviews with participants or stakeholders. Let's go back to the community garden example. Evaluation tasks could include things like data on water usage, like did you save water? Uh, or surveys assessing the feedback from the community the garden serves to how they like it. So um, this table here is a screenshot taken from our online Flux application. So when you go in there, this is what you'll see. And here's where you list your tasks, a brief description of the activities in that task, and include any significant outcomes and the time frame in which the task will be done. For demonstration purposes, we pre-filled this table on how it would look if it followed the four categories that I mentioned in the previous slides. So here is an example of, um, let's see, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, so here is an example of what it would look like. So planning and design, staff will conduct a site survey to assess soil health with the dates right there on the right. For outreach, staff and volunteers will organize two community meetings and promote the events through social media and distributed flyers and implementation. Um, staff and volunteers will build the raised beds and prepare the soil for planting approximately 30 species of native plants with signage. And finally, a staff will conduct a survey to assess community garden satisfaction and usage of the garden. Now, here's some, um, a few things you can do to boost your scope. They're um, helpful, but they're not mandatory. 
Um, one thing you can do that helps is providing the program to disadvantaged communities. Another thing is providing materials or the program in more than one language and also obtaining photo releases for parents, staff and participants. Um, this helps us with transparency and consent from all involved parties as well as a way to highlight your project and promote it on our media channels. And also um, providing demographic information of the community served. Now, let's do a little practice activity. So a little quiz here. And of the four buckets, uh, planning, outreach, implementation, or evaluation, I'm going to pose a scenario and then go ahead and guess where you think it would fall in the bucket. So the first one is, um, I got permission to use the community center for the summer camp. So without going planning, outreach, implementation, or evaluation. Sounds like something you do in advance, right? So it is, if you said planning, you're right. The next one we have, same, same idea, volunteers help participants on an educational hike. What does that sound like? Something that's happening during your event? So yeah, implementation. That would be the right um, bucket it would go in. The next one is program staff sends out an email blast as part of the project's outreach. There's a clue there. Let's see. Yeah, outreach. Right. That's it. Um, next one. Analyze survey results that showed 99% of the participants enjoyed the activity. Sounds like analyze, assessed, evaluation. That's right. So now I'm going to pass it over to Robert, who's going to cover budget. Great. Thanks, Diana. All right, so diving into what makes up your project's budget. Um, before we get into that, I just want to briefly talk about your total project cost and how that relates to the amount of mini grant funding that you're eligible for. So the total project cost refers to the entire cost associated with your project. And this includes any materials, labor, and any other relevant costs that you need to, to ensure project success. Um, for our mini grant programs, we use a specific formula to determine how much mini grant funding you are eligible for. So we typically calculate this by taking 75% of your total project cost. Um, in the next slide, you could see an example here where um, a total project cost is $7,000. Um, and in order to calculate the full, um, the eligible mini grant award, we take that cost and multiply it by 75%, which gives us that figure that you see on your screen, which is 5,250. Um, and that exceeds the maximum $5,000 grant amount. So this theoretical project would be eligible for the full $5,000, if that makes sense. Um, and if you have trouble figuring out your total project cost or any of the math, you could always reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to help you figure that out. But just as a general rule of thumb, this is just kind of what we use to assess that. So we always encourage our um, mini grant applicants to apply for the full $5,000. And um, there's always a way for us to kind of work with you to uh, bring up your total project cost or figure out what other costs can be included in your budget so that you could meet that uh, threshold. Next slide, please. All right, so there are a couple of different categories that go into your budget. Um, and so the first category that you see on here is monetary. So monetary expenses refer to the cash expenses associated with your project. These expenses are typically straightforward and can easily be tracked through receipts and invoices. Uh, examples of monetary expenses include uh, paid personnel, facility rental fees, purchase materials, paid transportation costs, or any permitting fees. Um, for in-kind contributions, on the other hand, uh, these refer to the non-monetary resources that are associated with your project, but they could still have an impact in the project's overall cost. So examples of in-kind contribution include volunteer labor, donated uh, materials or services, or shared facilities, equipment, or vehicles. Um, and on that little uh, link that you see down there, uh, which is also in the chat, um, it's a link to calculate volunteer time uh, or your volunteer labor. So if your project mainly involves volunteers, um, that's definitely something that you could include in your budget. 
as an in-kind contribution. And then you could use that link there to kind of calculate um, how much that adds into your budget. Next slide, please. All right, so this table is a screenshot also taken from the mini grant application on Flex. Uh, this is an example of how you would input any monetary or in-kind costs into your budget table, including the source of the funds. So the source, source one, is typically you know your applicant organization, so the, or your own organization. But if you have other organizations contributing to your project, you could add their names here, and then just list how much money they're contributing and how much in-kind contributions are also adding into this project. So for this right example right here, you could see that the monetary costs is $1,000 and the in-kind is $750. Um, one thing I forgot to mention too is that uh, for mini-grant projects, we do require a 25% match. Um, and that's something we could also figure out if you have any questions, but basically you just need to be able to demonstrate that 25% uh, of your project um, comes from you know your funding sources or from your own organization. Next slide, please. All right, so we have another practice activity here, just real quick, just um, letting you all know which category this might fall into. So is it in-kind or monetary? So for this one, uh, this example, it's uh, grantee staff uh, worked for four hours towards this task. So this sounds like this would fall under monetary since um, this is staff. So um, in this scenario, we assume that staff gets paid for the work that they're doing for the organization. Um, and so this would fall under monetary in your budget. Next slide. All right, so this one volunteers help to register participants. Um, this one kind of gives you a clue. Volunteer work, uh, as mentioned, can definitely fall in, into the in-kind category. So this one is in-kind. Right. And then third question here is complementary transportation was provided by another organization. So this one would fall under in-kind just because um, it says here the transportation was uh, provided by another organization as complementary. So in this case, probably there was probably no exchange of like um, cash or like it wasn't paid for that. So we could definitely count this as an in-kind contribution um, in your budget. Okay, next slide. All right, so now that we went over the scope and budget, um, we'll just kind of quickly recap on how the two are interconnected. So as mentioned, the scope outlines the tasks, deliverables, and timeline of your project. These activities serve as a foundation for organizing your budget, and they could be organized into the four buckets that Diana had discussed earlier, which are the planning design, outreach, implementation, and evaluation. Um, for the budget, these list the costs that go into your project. As you are developing your budget, you can align your budget categories to each task or bucket, which I'll be showing you in the next few slides. Um, great, so yeah, in this example, we'll, we'll take a look at the tables from earlier and we could kind of see how the two are connected. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you could see the task and deliverables are organized into the buckets that we talked about, which is planning design, outreach, and implementation. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we could see how that first task is breaking down or broken down into the corresponding funding sources. So for instance, task one, planning and design, um, the activities include content materials, mock-ups, um, and things like that. And then on the budget section, we, we could see how that task is broken down and how much uh, how much of the budget is coming from the grantee contribution and how much is being requested for the grant funds. So it looks here that the grant, grantee contribution um, is $800. And then for this task specifically, about $2,500 will be used out of the grant funds that is being requested. So the same format here is can be you know, followed with the rest of the uh, tasks that you see. So for outreach, you'll essentially do the same thing. How much money will be going into the activities that are listed in your outreach and how much are you requesting for your from the grant to be um, going into this bucket? Same with implementation and any evaluation tasks that you may have. So this is just, just again, just the kind of general framework that we kind of recommend and follow just because it's easier and 
or not, sorry, I shouldn't say easier, just because it provides a more smooth, um, you know, process when it comes to reviewing your application and then drafting up your agreement, because your agreement essentially will have the same kind of information that you see here. Um, and that is basically what uh, binds you to the project that uh, you will be doing. All right, next slide, please. All right, and then I'll pass it over to Diana to give us another great practice activity. Thank you, Robert. So here's the little practice activity on outlining a scope. Um, I'll pose a scenario and ask some questions. So in this scenario, a nonprofit has a project that would involve using an existing location for a community garden that would include demonstrations on water saving and environmentally sustainable garden components. So what kinds of activities and project costs would go into planning? So for planning, we're talking about things like permission to use the site because it's an existing location. So getting the permission from the property owner to uh, use their area to do your project, um, creating the demonstration materials. So that's part of your activity and part of your budget. Maybe there's some material costs that you need to consider for that. Um, purchasing the materials is where you actually go out and buy the things you need for your program. Um, training staff and volunteers here, there could be a cost associated with that, you know, of the volunteer in-kind time and your staff time. Um, designing the garden layouts, you know, you're having that done uh, internally or how's that working out? Um, purchasing your compost demonstration buckets. Here we go buckets. So purchasing those two, that could all go in planning. And then for outreach, um, here's another where, place where you would, you know, get your outreach plans together and your materials. Um, maybe there's some printing fees associated with printing flyers, put it there. And then maybe um, like social media posts, stuff like that. Maybe you wanna pay for boosting your social media posts or cost with that. Um, maybe you're placing an ad in the paper or online journal, that could be part of a cost. Or what if you're translating your outreach materials? That would be a good um, place to capture that here. And for implementation bucket, um, here's where you could be like holding the demonstrations, like the demonstration garden, you have your participants there, you're running your program. Um, surveys, the pre and post surveys that you're gonna have like before the participants start, you ask them, what do you know about sustainable gardening? And then after you ask them, what did you learn? So that could all go there. And your actual volunteer and staff time. Like this is where if you have volunteers, you would include that in this, the activity plus in your budget. So this is a good thing to remember to kind of try to capture that. Evaluation, this is the surveys that you're evaluating after the fact. Um, so let's just say you send out an email blast after, you know, oh, hey, how'd you like our program or something like that. That could be an evaluation and consider the cost associated with that. Um, testimonials, how you know you're gonna have people either a video testimonial or written testimonial could go there. Any reports that you wanna prepare related to, let's just say you're analyzing um, the water savings, the actual cost, lower cost of water use, you know, maybe that's an evaluation. And then just your program effectiveness, like how did the community like your project and stuff like that. So that's our little example. And I'm going to pass it over to Robert. That's going to give you some important reminders. All right. Thanks, Anna. Um, great. Yeah. So just to recap some important reminders for your budget and scope. So as you prepare your mini grant application, it's important to keep some of these things in mind. Um, so just some general do's and don'ts when it comes to drafting up your proposal. So we specifically require that projects don't contain any advocacy, lobbying efforts, or any other political component. Um, projects must be accessible by the public. Um, deliverables must be realistic, achievable, and demonstrable. Uh, insurance and general overhead costs cannot be included in your budget. So those are what, consi are what considered ineligible costs. Um, and if you have any questions too on you know, what should go in your budget or what can't go in your budget, 
you can always just reach out to us. Um, you know, the mini grant op uh, program offers a unique opportunity for us to kind of work with you to develop your application. Um, so we're, you know, we'd be more than happy to meet with you and uh, to kind of develop it as you go along as well. Uh, next slide. Great. And so we do have, um, you know, this pretty much concludes our presentation for today. And we do have a feedback survey that we'll be putting in the chat as well as sending out to you all. Um, but we'd love to get your feedback and input on what you thought about today's workshops and any, you know, any comments that could help us improve for future workshops. You know, we're always doing our best to improve these workshops and make our information more accessible. So any feedback would, uh, is welcome. And yeah, so as mentioned again, we're here to support you throughout the grant application process. So please reach out if you have any questions for the quickest response. We re recommend contacting us um, email or phone um, as our staff regularly checks our voicemail and as well as our emails. Um, if you have specific questions or need personalized assistance for your project, you could also schedule a meeting with us through our Calendly link. Um, and that will be also found on our grants webpage as well. All right, so um, that's pretty much it. But if we'll go ahead and stick around for a few more minutes, I know kind of ended a little bit early. So um, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to either raise your hand and we could unmute you or you could type that into the uh, Q&A portal. And just a reminder again to, uh, to please fill out the feedback survey if you feel compelled to. Um, also, are the Youth Commission applications um, that Clarissa was talking about at the beginning of this workshop are due this Friday. So if you know of any interested high school student in Santa Clara County, um, please pass the info along to them or have them reach out to us and we could connect them to with the, the right person. Okay, we got to thank you. Yes, thanks everybody for joining us. And like Robert said, we'll stick around to answer your questions. Okay, so we did get a question. Um, could you briefly talk about the monetary matching requirement? Yeah, I could take this one. Yeah, so for uh, refill stations, we don't require a match requirement, but for mini grants, we do require that 25% match. And so what that 25% match is that you, um, the grantee or your organization must be able to demonstrate that the funding sources that we talk about must equal to 25% of the total project cost. So if your total project cost, let's say costs about, what's a, what's a good number too, like $7,000, um, you would take 25% of that and um, what would that be? Basically 25% of that total project cost you must be able to demonstrate uh, through either your monetary contribution. So that's all the cash uh, contributions that we talked about or in-kind uh, contributions. So that's any like type of donations or volunteer labor that you are contributing to the project. Um, and so those are just kind of just the general things that we kind of ask you to keep in mind as you come up with your budget. Um, specifically for your mini grants. But yeah, if you have any questions, uh, you know, further questions about that, we could also talk more about that. Or if you're concerned about how to meet that match, we, we could uh, work with you on that as well. And it looks like we got, it, it looks like a question for the Youth Commission, um, but it looks like Clarissa answered it. The question was, do the kids need to live in Santa Clara County or can they just go to school there? Um, and they do need to live and attend high school in the county. Um, so Clarissa went ahead and put uh, that link in the chat, but thank you for that question. Um, another question for the mini grant, to put up signs to educate, what kind of permissions are needed? Does this need the pictures of the location too? Um, I can go ahead and try to answer that. Uh, so every mini grant is gonna be a little bit dis different. Um, it's kind of the sky's the limit. Uh, if you have a physical uh, grant, like the mural or a garden, then we ask that you um, provide a sign, um, the kind of uh, educating, you know, what it is and um, providing credit to Valley Water for partial funding of the um, the project. As far as permissions, uh, it really depends on the location. 
Um, so if you're doing a school garden, you would need permission, of course, from the school and probably the school district. If you're doing a mural, you'd want permission from the, the mural owner. So in the case of um, the mural we showed at the park, it was a, actually a county park building. So the grantee worked with them. Um, if it's a virtual education event or um, you're going on a trail hike in a public area, a public park, then you don't need any permission um, unless it meets the criteria of needing a permit. But for the most part, um, probably wouldn't. So um, the remaining part of this question is, does it need pictures of the location too? Again, it, it's kind of dependent on your, your grant project, but if it's a physical location, we would um, need a photo. And if it's not, or you're doing, like I said, a, a going to a public park and you're not necessarily creating anything physical or new, um, you wouldn't necessarily need a photo uh, for your application. But we would ask that you take a photo during the event, share that with us. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, if you wanna follow up, feel free to raise your hand or um, type uh, into the chat. Uh, so next question, can the grant include the cost of filters for filling the station? I'll go ahead and let Robert answer that one. Yeah, so um, for the refill station grant awards, um, as we mentioned, our $5,000 grant awards, and this uh, amount uh, is meant to cover the purchase or the cost of purchase installation as well as maintenance for your refill station. So um, yes, that could also include like the filters or any other replacement parts that you might need. Um, the only thing that we want to make clear, though, is that you cannot apply for a refill station grant for any type of maintenance of any existing refill station. So um, the refill station grant program is meant for new uh, stations that you purchase and install with the grant money. And whatever's left over from that grant money, which is, um, you know, it really depends on what style you choose. And um, whatever's left over from that, you could use to um, maintain that station for, you know, in the future. Uh, um, it really depends how many years it takes. But yeah, beyond the life of the agreement, that leftover money can be used to replace any filters or any other maintenance costs. But yeah, we just kind of urge you not to, um, or is, you're just not eligible to have a refill station grant award for any maintenance, like pure maintenance for any other existing stations. Yeah, so if you already had a refill station and, and it broke or needed some filters or maintenance, um, that's not, uh, it wouldn't be eligible for the grant. But if you put in a new one um, and you have money left over from the cost of installation and purchasing, you can um, hold on to those funds and uh, use it for maintenance. So good question. Uh, looks like we got another question about the Youth Commission. Uh, Clarissa? Yeah, I can take this one. So the Youth Commission, we usually do recruit every year. It does depend on how many commissioners are ending their two-year terms or, or how many are graduating from high school or say they move out of the county and they're no, no longer eligible, then their seat became becomes vacant. So this year we have nine vacancies throughout all the seven Valley Water districts. Great question. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions about the Youth Commission. That's fantastic. It's a great opportunity for um, students to get experience um, with politics and leadership. Um, so if they have any interest in those subjects for college, um, this might be a, a really good um, avenue for, for them to gain that experience. Uh, 